Good evening. I was uh, doing some programs at College Dale Academy this semester, and I passed out three by five cards to the students and asked them to turn in any questions they had about sex and sexuality. And so this talk is based off of 105 questions submitted by College Dale Academy students. Let's begin with prayer tonight. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your amazing design for humanity. And we thank you for the privilege of having this venue to talk tonight. And we ask especially that you will fill our hearts with your love and that we might have loving attitudes towards those who would do us harm. We pray in your holy name. Amen. We are doing human sexuality, God's design, your kids and their questions. The overview of what we're going to do, we're going to talk, why talk about sex? Why are we having this talk at all? The reason that's in red is because every time you see a red question, that is a verbatim question through the night submitted on a 3x5 card by one of the College of Academy students. They were all anonymous, so I can't tell you who submitted, so don't ask if your child submitted what. Okay. Uh, overview, so, so we're going to go through an uh, overview of, of some of those in the beginning, and then we'll come back and answer them at the end. God's design for human sexuality, what went wrong, neurobiology of sex, what's going on in the brain during sex, and then we'll look at the questions from the CA students in detail, and then what parents can do to help uh, their, their children, their adolescents deal with this issue. So, first question, this was submitted by a CA student. Why do people have to talk about sex so much? Is there really anything to talk about that hasn't been said? And as one parent said, two hours on sex, how many ways are they to say no? Well, why talk about sex? First reason, because we were created by God as sexual beings. This is part of our design. We were created in His image. Sexuality is part of our identity. Sexuality is part of what makes us godlike. It says in Genesis 5, 1 and 2, God made us in His image, male and female, made He them. And it's because of the fact we are sexual beings that we have such things as husband and wife, mother and father, Brother and sister. This is all part of sexual identity. Song of Solomon. Uh, you may or may not know Jewish tradition, but the Jewish tradition is that, is that the most holy place of the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, is the book Song of Solomon. This is the most holy place of the scripture. And, and the book Song of Solomon, you know, is about the human intimacy, which is a metaphor for Christ and his bride, Christ and his church. And you're going to learn tonight as we look at brain uh, function in sexual activity that there is an incredible lesson to be learned about what God's design is for our relationship and our bonding with him. Uh, sexuality, as God designed it, is a window into the heart of God and, what, and, and how he designed our relationship with him to grow. And we cannot fulfill God's plan without our sexuality. That was part of his plan. Be fruitful and multiply, he told them. So all of this is one of the reasons why we talk about sex. But why are we going to talk about sex? Second reason. Because your kids have questions. They have lots of questions. I received over 105 questions from College Dale Academy students. And this is a sample of some of the questions that I, I received. Is it a sin to have sex before marriage? Is, it, is, it, is safe sex okay at a young age? Is sex before marriage bad even if you marry the person you had sex with? Sex, is it as worth it before marriage as it is made out to be? What's your idea of the safest lines teens should draw in showing physical affection? Why does sex hurt us emotionally before marriage? Some of these questions are pretty good questions. What are the benefits of sex before marriage? If God will forgive you, then why can't you have sex before marriage? What diseases can you get from sex? Can you get AIDS from anal or oral sex? Can you make sex with your spouse dirty, or is whatever you do with your spouse considered fine? These are thoughtful questions. Is anal sex bad if done with spouses? Why is it okay to divorce and marry another person, but not have sex with more than one person? Now, by the way, while I'm presenting these questions, I want you all to be thinking, if your kids ask you these questions, how would you answer? Think that through as we go through. Um, what is adultery? How do you make a baby or become pregnant? And by the way, the asterisk is, I didn't tell you this, but the asterisk is, means that, that every asterisk represents another person who asked the same question. So that question was asked by six people. Does holding hands make you pregnant? 
Is there a safe time of the month of a girl cycle to have sex? How can you tell love sex from lust sex? Good question, I thought. Do you change emotionally after sex for the first time? Why is our school so oblivious to how many kids, younger class especially, are having sex? Do they not care? Is homosexuality sin, oral anal sex between men? Four, four people asked that question. Is masturbation sin? Six people asked that question. Are you still a virgin if you've had orgasm? Are you considered virgin if you've had sex other than vaginal sex? Why do, you, why do I feel so bad about the fact I had sex even though I made it right with the Lord? Every one of these questions asked by a CA student. So, why talk about sex? Because God created us as sexual beings. It's part of our identity. Because the kids have lots of questions. And your kids are being bombarded with sexual information every day in our country. But from where? Average American teen will watch 15,000 sexual acts per day, on, uh, per year, on television. I don't know if you knew that. 15,000 sexual acts per year portrayed in teen, teen television. 2,000 beer and wine commercials per year. Children uh, And children don't differentiate the difference between television and real world. They believe that what they see on television is reliable and trustworthy and therefore um, something to base decisions on. Media constantly normalizes or bombards teens with sex and they think it's normal and they should be doing it. And teen programming has more sexual content than adult programming, but less than 10% of the content shows responsible behavior. So 90% of teen programming with sexual content is, shows irresponsible behavior. Two-thirds of teens have seen pornography on the Internet. Three, three out of six major networks will not allow advertising for condoms or birth control, but yet allow ads for male enhancement drugs. Six studies document that the higher exposure to media sexual content that teens get, the earlier that they have sex. So media has a big impact on what kids are doing. So your kids have questions and they're being bombarded with this information. Pornography, $57 billion worldwide industry, $12 billion a year in the United States. The porn revenue is larger than all combined revenues of all professional football, baseball, and basketball franchises. U.S. porn revenue exceeds the combined revenues of the ABC, CBS, and NBC, almost double. And child pornography generates $3 billion a year in the United States. 4.2 million pornographic websites, 12% of the Internet websites are pornographic. 68 million daily web searches, 25% of the search engine searches are for pornography. 20% of men visit porn sites while at work. And 47% of Christians say porn is a major problem in their home. It's almost half of Christian families. Visitors to porn sites, generally 72% men and 28% women. So, God created us as sexual beings. We have sexual identity. Kids have lots and lots of questions. They're searching for answers. Where would you like them to get their answers? From the media, from the internet, or maybe somewhere else. So your kids are currently forming their beliefs. And the media impacts the, the information they get, how they form beliefs, and what attitudes they have. And what we believe has power over us. Power to heal and power to destroy. Some of you have heard the story already of Vance Vanders, who on his way home one night cut through the cemetery in southern Alabama and was confronted by a witch doctor who wafted a foul-smelling stuff in his face, pronounced a curse on him, told him that he would go home, get sick, and he would not recover and die. He went home that night, very restless, couldn't sleep, tossing and turning all night, woke up the next morning aching and hurting all over, nauseated, couldn't eat, stayed in bed, didn't go to work that day, restless next night, couldn't sleep, nauseated, sick, kept getting worse and weaker. And after a couple of weeks at home and, and getting worse and weaker and not eating, they took him to the hospital. They ran all kinds of tests. They couldn't really find a disease state causing this. And the family finally told them about the curse, told the doctor about the curse. The doctor thought very carefully went home, came in the next morning, called the family together and said, last night I lured the witch doctor back to that cemetery. I pinned him against a tree and I forced him to tell me how the curse worked. Vance, he rubbed lizard eggs into your abdomen and one of those eggs hatched and is eating you from the inside out. And then he calls a nurse in and with great ceremony draws up in a syringe a clear liquid which was an emetic, uh, a medicine that makes you vomit and injected this medicine into Vance. And as he's vomiting up uh, whatever's in his guts into this basin, the doctor secretly and surreptitiously drops a little green lizard into the vomit. 
and says, Vance, look, the, the curse is broken. And Vance sees the lizard, his eyes pop open. He falls into a deep sleep, wakes up about three hours later, hungry, ravenously hungry, eats and recovers without any difficulty. What we believe has power over us. Power to heal and power to destroy. You've heard of the placebo effect. I want to tell you about placebo and nocebo effect. Placebo effect is when you receive a sugar pill, but you believe it's something to benefit you, like a pain medicine. If you believe that it will help your pain, you believe it's actually pain medicine, even though it's a sugar pill, your brain will release endorphins and enkephalins, which are naturally occurring opioids or painkillers, and dopamine, which is a mood elevator. And so the belief in this sugar pill causes neurobiologic changes that alter your mood and sense of well-being. If you know it's a sugar pill, you don't get that sense. The nocebo effect is just the opposite. It's what happened to Vance. You've been cursed. You believe something bad is happening to you. The brain suppresses the release of endorphins and enkephalins and suppresses the release of dopamine. So you get aches and pains all over and you get a very dysphoric, uh, unpleasant, unhappy emotional state uh, just from changing what you believe. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, the scripture tells us. So our beliefs determine who we come, who we become. So we need to talk because your kids have questions. They're forming beliefs. What beliefs do you want them to form? What message do we want to send our kids about sex? Thou shalt not commit adultery, just say no. Is that the message? Does abstinent only ed- education work? No, it doesn't work because it doesn't change their beliefs. Remember, they're forming their beliefs and what we believe has power over us. Just say no does not compete against all the beliefs they're forming from the media and the secular world. What we believe has that power over us. So, according to the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, 20,000 students, high school students, evaluated from 1997 to 2002. What they discovered is Christian students in high school who took the abstinent pledge had a marked increase in high-risk sexual behavior, 13% of them, compared to those who did not take such a pledge, 2%. And high-risk behavior included unprotected vaginal sex, but also marked increases in oral and anal sex for for those taking the abstinent pledge. Three studies have demonstrated that abstinence-only education does not work. Why? Why does it not work just to say no? Because there's a problem with the just say no philosophy. God didn't create us as asexual beings until marriage, and then magically, a sexual switch is turned on in our brain the day we get married. Single people are sexual beings. And just say no message distorts their thinking with messages, distorted messages like, we aren't comfortable discussing what you do with your sexual desires, what to do with your sexual desires as a single person. If you just say no, you'll forget you're a sexual being and won't struggle anymore. Or... What's wrong with you? You're single. You aren't supposed to have sexual desires. Or, overcoming sin is just a matter of human effort. Just say no. It fails to connect kids with divine power for real victory. Because human effort alone will not get this job done. So, come and reason, Isaiah says. Come and reason. Though your sins are scarlet be white like snow, we must educate our, our kids about God's design, about Satan's attack, and the reasons for following God's methods. Why do each of you in this room brush your teeth today? Is it because, well, my mom said, just do it? Or have you somewhere along the line learned the reasons for it, and those reasons have kept you for doing it? We need to educate our kids uh, on God's design for sexuality, the reasons to wait until marriage, which leads the kids back to a knowledge of God in a relation with Him they are empowered to live victoriously. And, And I don't think, frankly, we've done a very good job of this. So, another question from one of the kids. What was God's original design for our reproduction? So, let's talk about God's original design. Some of you may have heard a little bit of this before. Some of you may have not. But, God, uh, God created man in his own image. He created a male and female. He created them. Notice, them, male and female. Then the Lord said, Lord God made a woman from the rib of Adam... This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. We all know what that's talking about, one flesh. The the man and the wife were both naked and felt no shame. This is God's design. What does this mean? Sexual desire is normal. God designed us with sexual desire. God designed, designed it this way. It is not a sin to have sexual desire. But the desire is to be governed by godly judgment. And then man 
is not male. Man is male and female in God's design. Notice the scripture. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you read other versions, it makes it very straight. They were created male and female. Man was created. So man in God's design, it takes maleness and femaleness to represent rightly the Godhead. Maleness or femaleness alone is not a full revelation of God's design. Because part of God's design is for them to be fruitful and multiply. Maleness alone, femaleness alone cannot be fruitful and multiply. There's no procreation there. Part of God's design is that we reveal Him as the Creator. So it takes both to represent the Godhead. God's original design, as you know in 1 John, we are created in His image, so we need to understand His image. And His image is the image of love. And the Bible tells us that love is not self-seeking. And since love doesn't seek self, love does seek Others, outward-moving, other-centered, love is giving, it's beneficent, it's outward-moving. And the Bible tells us that we can see in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that that God's divine nature is seen in what he has made so that men are without excuse. We can actually look into nature and see this design template, this protocol for life. And I'll just give a couple examples, some of you have heard. Um, The oceans give their waters to the clouds. The clouds give their waters, forming lakes, rivers, and streams, which flow back to the ocean, a never-ending circle of giving, which brings life to everything. If a body of water separates from that circle of giving, it stagnates and everything and it dies. It is the never-ending giving that brings life. Every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide freely. The plants give back oxygen to you, bringing life, the law of love, the law of giving. If you decide I don't want to be part of that, I'm going to take my carbon dioxide, I'm going to keep it, put a plastic bag over my head so you can't have it. The only way to do that is to stop breathing and to die. The law of love is the law of giving, outward-centered movement. So why was it not good for Adam to be alone? Day one, it is good. Day two, it is good. Three, four, five, six, it is not good that man, that Adam, should be alone. Because he was created in God's image. And God's image is the image of love, which is the image of giving. And so we have this distorted idea that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone because Adam needed to help me. Someone to you know, do his laundry and cook his meals and bring him the ranch while he's under the hood. But that is not what it means. And i got to tell you, I had somebody in my office today, a woman in my office today, who is in a marriage where her husband thinks it's very much. They're very, very religious people, go to church every week, and in her marriage, she is the helper to help him do what he wants. And there's a hierarchical relationship there. This is not what this means. God, man, uh, Eve was made as a helper for Adam to help him with one thing. Understanding God's nature of love... Adam could not enter into other-centered love without someone for Adam to serve. Without someone for Adam to sacrifice himself for. Without someone for Adam to give himself to lift up and benefit. So Eve was recreated to help Adam enter into what it's like for God to give himself to love others more than himself. And Eve was to receive that love and let it flow back through her to Adam again. A never-ending circle of other-centered love, the Godhead in microcosm. That's God's design for a loving marriage. So what went wrong? Adam and Eve sinned. What happened? Lies believed break the circle of love and trust. You're in a healthy, loving marriage. Somebody close to you, your own mother, father, brother, sister, comes to you and tells you a lie that your spouse is having an affair. Now, it's not true. No truth in it whatsoever. But if you believe the lie, does something inside of you change? If you believe your spouse is cheating. Love and trust is broken. This is what happened in, the, in Eden. Lies were believed, love and trust was broken. Um, lies believed, broken love and trust result in fear and selfishness. God, I don't believe you've really got my good interests at heart. I believe that you're trying to keep me down. Satan's lie to Adam and Eve. Therefore, I can't trust you anymore. I'm afraid of you. So I've got to watch out for myself. I better get that fruit before I, before I lose my chance to get ahead. Fear and selfishness in the world today is known as survival of the fittest. This instinct to watch out for number one. This instinct to hurt others to protect self. And then fear and selfishness results in destructive acts, what we call sins, the bad things we do, which are the symptoms of this, of this broken love and trust, this heart condition of, of fear and selfishness. And these destructive acts result in damage to, to mind, health, and character, which is a terminal condition. Christ said in Matthew 5, you say if you commit adultery, do a bad act. You've committed sin. I say if you lust after a woman in your heart, 
you've already committed adultery. What is he telling us? That the bad behavior is symptom of sick hearts. And when the hearts are right, the behavior goes right. So we have these two antagonistic principles on, on earth now that each one of us are struggling with. God's principle of love, greater love is no man that he give his life for a friend, which means I love you so much I'll do whatever I have to for your health and welfare and beneficence, including, if it comes down to it, give my life that you might live. At war with Satan's principle of survival, the fittest based on fear and insecurity, which says, I love myself so much I'll do whatever I have to to promote and protect myself, including, if it comes down to it, kill you that I might live. Give my life that you might live, kill you that I might live. The love Versus the fear battle in each of our hearts. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid because they were afraid. Fear, part of the infection of sin. Perfect love casts out all fear. You see, this is the battle between God's law of love, Satan's principle of fear and self-centeredness. And so in the brain, we have this battle going on between the fear circuits and the love circuits of our brain. This The amygdala, fear, alarm, anxiety. This is the amygdala of our brain. And it is analogous to the fire alarm that you might see in a building. A little red thing on the wall you pull, break the glass, set off the alarm. And when the fire alarm goes off in the brain, it alerts the brain's 911 operator, which is this little yellow part right here called your hypothalamus, which is connected to your pituitary gland. And the job of the 911 operator when the alarm goes off in the building is to call in emergency responders. And the emergency responders in our body come from our adrenal glands, our our stress hormones of of adrenaline and glucocorticoids. And when the emergency responders arrive at the scene of the fire, there's a fire chief who assesses how big the blaze is, how many responders we have, calls back to the 911 operator and says, hey, you got enough, you don't need us in anymore. In our brain, hippocampal neurons have stress hormone receptors, glucocorticoid receptors, that register this rise, signal back to the hypothalamus, say you got enough, you don't need us in anymore. How this works in your life. You're walking along this weekend with your family. Well, maybe not this weekend. We'll put it into the spring when it's a little warmer. Walking along in the spring with your family in the park, and you step forward in the grass, and out of the corner of your eye, you see something black and slithery down at your feet. What are you likely to do? Your alarm's going to fire. Call in emergency responders. Your heart rate's going to pick up. Your blood pressure's going to pick up. Your your respirations are going to pick up. Blood is going to shunt out of your guts into your muscles so you can... Run out of there as fast as you can. You might be two or three steps away already before the prefrontal cortex, right here where you do your thinking, catches up and goes, it's just a rubber hose. Haven't you had something like this happen? Now, this is critically important. As soon as the prefrontal cortex says, it's just a rubber hose, what happens inside of you? Does the alarm turn off and everything start coming down? Part of the job of the prefrontal cortex is to process this stuff coming out of this, what we call the limbic system, this emotional center down here, and when appropriate, turn that system off, calm it down. One of the problems that many people have in life, most of the patients I see in my office have this trouble, is there's a dysregulation. This is what sin has done. It's dysregulated our normal balance that God has designed. These fear centers are way out of control, and we have lost the ability to govern ourselves well. I'll tell you, I'll probably come back to this again, but I'll mention it right now. In between the the prefrontal cortex where you do your thinking, reasoning, planning, and the emotion centers is the anterior cingulate cortex. And the anterior cingulate cortex is where we have the will, your power of choice. When you say, I choose to do this, and I choose to do that, you're exercising your will. Not only that, the anterior cingulate cortex is where we experience empathy, compassion, other-centered, altruistic love, caring for another person more than ourselves. Now, what's interesting is that when the anterior cingulate cortex is active in a loving, other-centered way, it is wired into our alarm in such a way that it turns the alarm off. So the more you have other-centered love and activity here, the less fear you have. Neurobiologically, they're like a seesaw. When this activates it's hard to keep the anterior cingulate cortex active. This is why people in, in great panic and fear often don't think very clearly, and they aren't very gracious. You know, this is why people get stampeded at a theater when there's a fire. They don't think clearly, and they aren't very loving to let some little old lady go before them out the door. They just run right over her. Boom. Okay? Because fear is in control. Okay. Um, 
Now these two, two uh, areas of our brain, actually the Bible talks about. It says in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is where we have truth, prefrontal cortex. But the Bible says in James that we are drug away and enticed by our own evil desires. They come out of this part of our brain. Now, what happens when we have unhealthy thought or belief systems? Remember I told you earlier, beliefs affect us and change us. If you believe things like this, everybody thinks I'm stupid. People, people think I'm fat. Nobody likes me. No, no, nobody will ever love me. I'm too ugly to be loved. Uh, these types of thoughts. What do you think happens in your mood centers? When you come around people, when somebody walks in the room, maybe you think a particular guy or girl is cute, but you have these beliefs about yourself. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. I'm no good. When that person comes around, do you think you feel at peace and relaxed? Or do you think you feel very tense and, and, and stressed? The alarm center is fire because we have these lies in our head. Lies are what damage us, these unhealthy belief systems we have. This is why truth heals and truth sets free. So, why does sex hurt us emotionally? And, and understanding, I want you to understand those fear circuits, love circuits, because we understand why does sex hurt us emotionally before marriage? Do you change emotionally after having sex for the first time? Well, first, and there's, there's going to be two parts to this answer on the emotion. First part is the fear circuits that we're going to talk about. Premarital sex, limbic system, during premarital sex, or adultery, adulterous relationships, it is a process in which the emotion centers are overruling good judgment. And when emotional centers overrule good judgment, um, our conscience, out of our prefrontal cortex, our judgment, our reason, convicts us. I shouldn't have done that. What was I thinking? We then begin to lie and deceive Lie to our friends, lie to our parents, lie to our our siblings, which causes more conviction of guilt and fear. You see, when we do wrong, then this fires the fear circuits. Now let's talk about what firing fear circuits do to us as far as ability to grow and develop. Fear is the medium of death, I'll just tell you. Love is the medium of life. When the fear circuits of the brain fire, physiologically, they shunt blood out of your guts into your muscles so you can fight or flight. But if the blood is out of your guts, can you absorb nutrients? And in fact, if you've just eaten a very heavy meal and you've been seriously frightened, what's likely to happen? You're going to vomit the meal up because all the blood is shunting away and the body wants to get rid of it. You really can't grow well physically if you're in constant state of fear. What about cognitively, scholastically? Ever heard of test anxiety? Or maybe somebody, stage fright, somebody comes up here at church and and they know exactly what they're going to say, they get up there and they walk up and they get in front of the mic and, and they freeze. What happened? Fear circuits fire and they paralyze the prefrontal cortex. So we can't think clearly. So we don't reason well. We don't understand. We don't process when we're in fear. So we don't grow intellectually. Think about relationships. Think about how other-centered you are when you're in moments of desperate fear. How kind you are when you're in moments of desperate fear. Fear paralyzes our relational growth. And what about spiritual growth? Do you think we grow close to God when we're terrified of him? Fear is the medium of death. Love is the medium of life. And it's just the opposite, which allows this type of growth on every level. Okay, so with that in mind, premarital sex, what happens in our mind? What happens in our brain? What happens in these circuitries when we're having premarital sex? Well, first, our prefrontal cortex convicts us. We get a sense of guilt. We get a sense of fear. We worry. We lie. All this kind of stuff happens. And how do we resolve the guilt? Well, there are only two ways to resolve guilt. And guilt is a very destructive emotion. It fires the amygdala. And I don't think I mentioned this, but I'll just go tell you. If the amygdala never turns off, if the fear center never winds down, even though we had our fire chief holding our 911 operator in check, if the amygdala keeps firing, that stress hormone, it will activate peripherally in your body, um, your, your macrophages, your, your white blood cells. And your macrophages begin releasing toxic little terrorists, inflammatory factors called cytokines. And these cytokines do terrible things through our body. They damage insulin receptors in our body, 
They cause neurotransmission problems so that if I were to take just a, a syringe full of cytokines and inject into you, within a few hours you would be experiencing terrible aches and pains all over your body, appetite disturbance, sleep disturbance, concentration impairments. And, and extreme fatigue and malaise. These are what these inflammatory factors do. Now, these inflammatory factors then cause, cross into the blood-brain barrier and cause a cascade of inflammation in the brain, which begin damaging the white cells of our brain, brain which support the neurons, and ultimately suppress genes in our brain that keep our brain healthy and lead to depression. This is what happens when this cascade of stress doesn't turn off. The stress diathesis leads to all this physical health problems and um, mental health problems. So how do we resolve guilt? We want to resolve guilt because guilt keeps that, that amygdala turned on. Well, we have God's way. Repentance and, if possible, restoration. Experiencing, through God's grace, a new heart and a right spirit, and then the guilt is, is resolved and, and we can move on in peace because we've been changed and we've experienced reconciliation. But there is another way to avoid the guilt, and that way is denial and distortion. It wasn't me. It was the woman you gave me. She wouldn't have brought me that fruit. I wouldn't have done anything. I'm okay. She's the one with the problem. Denial and distortion. But denial and distortion damages the mind. You've ever heard that statement? He's bending the truth. She's twisting the truth. You've heard that? Truth can't be bent or twisted. Truth is truth. So imagine a telephone pole we're looking at, and I hold a lens up between you and the pole, and now you look at the pole through the lens, the pole appears bent. Have we bent the pole? Pole's still straight. We've only bent our view of the pole. This is what people do to avoid guilt. They have to bend their view of the world. And they have to put this lens on their mind. And it's not just on this one issue. Once the lens, once this warp, once this distorted lie they've got in their mind is there, they take it with them everywhere. And if you've ever met people like this, think about this. You're looking at the telephone pole without a lens. They're looking at the pole through the lens, but they don't know they're wearing a lens. Will you ever convince them the pole straight? Have you talked to people like this? They just don't seem reasonable. The evidence doesn't seem to have any. They twist everything you say. Yeah, they ha- they, they've got warped minds because they're avoiding, something, uh, they're avoiding something in their life that will bring conviction and guilt. And the only way to unwarp the mind is by the truth. As we bring truth back into the mind, it unwarps and takes this lens away. So... How, how are we changed with premarital sex? With this type of guilt leading to denial and distortion and all these other things that damages us. Now, even more interesting is uh, a brain hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin produced by your hypothalamus and secreted by your pituitary gland. What does oxytocin do? Now, this is going to be fascinating because this is where we get into human bonding and, and, and connection and relationships. Oxytocin outside the brain causes the uterus to contract to start labor and help expel the baby during um, labor and delivery. So that's one of its roles outside the body and outside, excuse me, outside the brain. And outside the brain, it also causes um, the milk to be produced and released during breastfeeding. But in the brain, oxytocin in the brain causes neurologic changes that give us a sense of bonding to another person. And this is non-cognitive bonding. In other words, it's not a purposeful choice to be bonded and feel close to somebody. So if oxytocin is being secreted in a relationship that is enjoyable, pleasurable, and you're going to find in a moment it requires the combination with dopamine, if that happens, then you will feel bonded to somebody, a close kinship. And the more oxytocin, the stronger the bond without even making a choice to do so. The oxytocin also calms the fear centers. So you become more calm, less fearful when you have oxytocin release. It lowers the blood pressure, lowers the heart rate, and lowers the stress hormone level circulating. Oxytocin increases the sense of trust. So if oxytocin is being secreted and you're feeling that close bond, you're feeling a greater sense of trust in that person. And this, again, is not necessarily cognitive trust. It causes a selective amnesia. Selective amnesia, so that you remember the good things and you forget the painful and bad times. It actually airbrushes your memory. And and one evidence for that is, why would a woman ever have a child again after going through labor? Okay? There was huge oxytocin releases that airbrushed the memory. Oh, it was painful. It wasn't that bad. Okay? It was worth it. You know, uh, but that's one one of the things it does. It also uh, reduces pain sensitivity, so you can tolerate more pain when oxytocin is being secreted. It decreases uh, tolerance to drugs, which means it diminishes the risks of addiction. 
and it decreases social aggression, improving social recognition, and more, basically it's like social lubricant. We get along with people better when we have more oxytocin, except in one place. And that is if someone threatens the object of your love. For instance, moms, you've got this huge oxytocin surge at, at birth, and you've got this great bond to your infant, and you're down at the nursery, and you see somebody coming in stealing somebody else's baby. Well, you would do whatever you could, call the alarm, uh, call the police, scream, holler. If somebody's trying to take your baby, does a vicious, violent woman come out? Okay? Yes, because that oxytocin bonded you, that it will cause you to be extremely aggressive if somebody threatens the one you're bonded to. So other than that, it actually reduces aggressiveness. Now, psychiatric disorders are linked to oxytocin. Uh, there is a variant of obsessive compulsive disorder that in families without Tourette syndrome, uh, you can have from too much oxytocin. Now think oxytocin is the chemical that causes bonding. Uh, OCD is this, I'm overly sticky, can't let go of stuff. So too much oxytocin can cause a variant of OCD. Decreased oxytocin receptors in the amygdala, that's the fear center, is associated with anxiety disorders, both social anxiety and generalized anxiety. And then elevated oxytocin receptors. Too many of these receptors in the amygdala is associated with a syndrome called Williams syndrome. Now, Williams syndrome is interesting. It's, it, it happens because uh, on chromosome number 7, they're missing 25 genes. And for whatever reason, because those genes are missing, they get extra oxytocin receptors in the amygdala. And these kids, if they have this disorder, people with this disorder have no social fears or no social apprehensions at all. A child will walk into a strange room and they will act to every person like they're their brother or sister or mom or dad. They just love everybody. They have no strangers. They have no apprehensions, warnings, or guards at all because the amygdala is completely just turned off. There's no fear. There's no apprehension. That's Williams syndrome. It's very dangerous, as you can imagine, for, for young kids. You have to really watch them because they don't have any normal apprehensions. And there's another disorder that I'm about to pop on the screen, but see if anybody can guess what it is, which is an absolute reduction in oxytocin receptors and oxytocin production. What? And it's just the opposite of Williams syndrome. Autism. Autism is associated. This is kids that don't socially connect at all, and they're in their own world, and it's associated with, with oxytocin impairments in the brain. So, activities now which increase oxytocin. Think of all these things it's doing to us. Wow, this could be a very powerful thing on us. What increases oxytocin in our brain? First thing is childbirth. And this is just a graph showing normal, here's your oxytocin levels, and then here comes delivery. Shoom, this huge, giant oxytocin surge. There's 30 minutes after delivery, and then three hours postpartum, you've got this opportunity, this window, where they put your child in your arms, you have this really powerful bonding that occurs uh, right immediately postpartum. And then activities which increase it, not only childbirth, but breastfeeding. So every time a, a woman breastfeeds her child, there's more oxytocin surges, which enhance that bonding. This is one of the reasons moms often have a closer bond with their kids than dads. Dads didn't get these big oxytocin surges. See, it's not that we're really not so sweet and loving. All right, as skin-to-skin -skin touching, but this is pleasurable skin-to-skin -to -skin touching. Uh, people down in Abu Ghraib or some uh, prison, they're getting tortured for information with the fist hit in the face. That skin-to-skin -skin touching is not going to get a lot of um, oxytocin releasing. It has to be skin-to-skin -skin touching that is enjoyable or pleasurable uh, that you're voluntarily participating in, not something that is frightening you and terrifying you. Massage, for instance, can cause, oxy cause oxytocin release. Hugs causes it. Sexual foreplay, intercourse, and orgasm increase oxytocin release. Relational activities that are non-stressful, nurturing, and pleasurable all cause oxytocin release. That's how friendships bond over time. As we spend time together, we enjoy each other, we, we feel good with each other, we get oxytocin, we have this bonding and kinship and friendship. But interestingly enough, relationships which involve trust. Not only does oxytocin increase trust, when you extend trust to somebody, it, it, it results in oxytocin increases. Now, I put on here combat and mission trips. If anybody knows anything about combat, you'll know that some of the closest human bonds forged happen in combat. People coming back from combat will have closer relationships oftentimes than with family members. And the reason for that has to do with the trust issue. You see, in combat, people will find themselves where their absolute life is on the line, and they are out there with somebody that they completely trust with their life. That requires huge oxytocin surges. And when that happens, there's this forge, this bond that happens. Why is that important for you to understand? Because you want to be careful on what trips you send your kids on. This is why a lot of times, see, kids go on a mission trip, 
They're in a foreign land. No one speaks a language. The culture is all different. They have heightened sense of anxiety, apprehension, and there is you know, somebody in their class that speaks the same language. They can connect to, they feel safe with, they trust and extend trust to like they've never trusted before. They're going to get huge oxytocin surges and they're going to come back in love. I love him. I didn't realize I loved him. Going on this trip, we have so much in common. (laughs) It's oxytocin, okay? Oxytocin surges. So you have to be careful this type of stuff. Trials and trust. Trials and trust. This goes back now to our spiritual. Understanding this oxytocin. Understanding trusting someone with your life, with your circumstances, causes oxytocin shifts. Read this in the scriptures, First Peter. In, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so your faith... What's another word for faith? Trust. So your trust of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it is refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise and glory. So we find ourselves in trials and difficulties, and we extend our trust in God, we're going to get oxytocin surges, which are going to bond us closer and closer to God. But only if you're not afraid of God. Because, after all this stuff I've told you, and this is why what what we do in our class, constantly trying to promote the truth about God that takes away fear. Fear impairs oxytocin. Activities that decrease oxytocin is stress, adrenaline, cortisol, your fear, hormones impair the release of oxytocin. That's why if somebody is giving you a massage, but they are maybe like some rapist and some like perverted thing and you've got a gun to your head, you're not going to get oxytocin surges, okay? Fear is like suppressing that whole thing. And that's a good thing. You wouldn't want to bond to your rapist, right? Okay? So it's good it's designed this way, but spiritually... If we have fear of God, it impairs our union, our unity, our oneness with Him. You see the devil's strategy. And you see how fascinating it is how we're made. So, relational trauma uh, and non-relational traumas of any kind, increasing fear, impairs oxytocin surges. Pain, both physical and emotional pain, impair or suppress oxytocin surges. And then drugs. Every illegal drug suppresses oxytocin. Uh, especially narcotics. Narcotics suppress oxytocin. But in addition to suppressing oxytocin, amphetamines and cocaine damage the pleasure centers, the the dopamine centers of your brain. And so what what this means is, and, and and the meaning of all this, what's the importance of it? That the best sex occurs in a healthy, loving marriage. That's what it means. Because the best sex happens when there's very little stress, very little anxiety, very little worry, very little pain. No, none of this partying out on the street and picking somebody up in a bar. When a loving, trusting relationship. So what does this mean for our bonding with God? Well, I talked to you already about the neurological heart, the neurological heart right here. Studies show, University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Newberg, did some very interesting studies. 12 minutes a day meditation on a God of love shows growth in the anterior cingulate cortex in 30 days. It's larger. Not only did it show growth, it showed calming of the amygdala with reductions in stress hormones, uh, heart rate, and blood pressure within 30 days, and improved memory. And these p- patients they were doing this on, or people in the study, were 60 to 65 years of age. So these are not just young kids whose brains are real pliable and grow real fast. This is in anybody. And if you remember what Ellen White said, that it would be good for us to spend a thoughtful hour a day contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. And what are the closing scenes of the Christ, uh, Christ's life t- uh, trying to reveal to us except the most powerful revelation of other-centered, self-sacrificing love? And as we contemplate that kind of love, our love centers and our brain grow and our fear is reduced. And then when we have that loving understanding of God and we find ourselves in trials and trust him, then we get greater oxytocin surges and greater, uh, greater bonding with him. So Christ and his bride, the God concept which, which incites fear impairs genuine trust and faith because it's not going to allow this oxytocin surge. God concepts which incite fear prevent growth in the anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, worshiping a God of love causes the anterior cingulate cortex to grow and... Circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit is a literal change in brain wiring that comes when we come to the truth about God and trust Him. We bond with God. I think that's pretty cool. So the chemistry of sexual activity. 
Let's look at the chemistry of sexual activity. Sexual activity, in the foreplay stage, we're getting norepinephrine, we're getting increased energy, focus, muscle tension, heart rate's going up, blood pressure's going up, we're getting excitement, our breathing's getting faster, we're getting dopamine surge, we're getting this pleasure, we're having fun. This is exactly what cocaine does to our brain. But not only that, we get endorphins when we're having sex. We get, we get these natural opiates. It creates a euphoria, high. It dilates the, the blood vessels. We, get, we eliminate pain. We feel good all over, which is exactly what heroin does. And we also get serotonin and GABA increases that cause a great sense of calm, a relaxation, a warm fuzzy all over, which is exactly what marijuana does. Now do you see why sexual addiction is difficult to overcome? So then why doesn't everybody get sexual addiction? Because during sex, in a loving, centered, other-centered relationship, large amounts of oxytocin is released, and oxytocin diminishes the tolerance, neurobiologically in your brain, in the dopamine pathways, in the opioid pathways, and in the GABA circuitry, the, the oxytocin protects those circuits from adaptation that occurs when we use drugs of abuse. So you don't get tolerance, you don't get addiction. But without the oxytocin, then you can have that problem happen. And so sex, as God designed it, involves a physical touch, positive affirmation, trusting relationships, all which increase oxytocin. And then when it all climaxes in this huge dopamine surge, and the combination of both neurotransmitters together result in a powerful bonding experience without addiction. But oxytocin without dopamine, no bonding. And dopamine without oxytocin, no bonding. So, sexual gratification without the high oxytocin increases our risk of sexual addiction. So what if sex with high anxiety, guilt, fear, like pornography, deviant behaviors, premarital sex, what, what's going to happen? What's the risk? Well, the high anxiety, the stress, the fear, raises catecholamine levels. Catecholamine stress hormones, what do they suppress? Oxytocin. Without oxytocin, having sex increases the risk of sexual addiction. This is why people get addicted to pornography. Or sex with naivety, infatuation, premarital sex, infatuation. Increase oxytocin with subsequent increased in bonding, selective memory, loss of healthy discrimination and judgment. You get this infatuated, overly attached, dependent, needy thing going on and you can't reason and think anymore, and it doesn't matter what the person does, you still have this gooey-eyed thing because your, your oxytocin is like uh, blurring your ability to actually remember anything of substance to make a healthy decision on. So sex and partner selection. Once sexually involved, we have increased dopamine and oxytocin, which the brain rewires. The brain with this combination actually rewires in such a way that the person that you're having sex with, the sensory stimulation from them, hearing their voice, seeing their face, touching them, uh, seeing a picture of them, thinking about them, will cause more release in your reward pathways, your dopamine pathways, than any other person. So they can make you feel good. Just thinking about them, seeing their picture, hearing their voice, you feel good with them like no one else. Your brain rewires because of this oxytocin dopamine combination. This results in less flexibility in partner selection, which is a good thing if you're married to the person. That's what you want. Okay? That's exactly how God designed it. It's not so good if you're like 16 and hadn't figured out things yet and who you're going to spend your life with. So premarital sex increases the risk of enhanced bonding to a non-spouse, Diminished discernment, discrimination, impaired judgment, selective amnesia, greater trust without evidence, greater emotional attachment. So you lose some of your autonomy and free will and become more bonded in a chemical way to somebody you might not ultimately want to be with. And this is what happens when a lot of people have this sexual activity. They end up marrying people and later down the road as things don't work out and the stress hormones start rising because the constant conflict and fighting, the oxytocin eventually wears off and they really much hate each other. Because they didn't take their time to actually develop a love relationship first. Greater pain at the loss of the relationship uh, if, if we had this premarital sex going on. So you have premarital sex and your relationship ends, it's more painful emotionally 
because these oxytocin bonding thing has to rewire. Greater pain diminishes the oxytocin. So in the next relationship, unless there's time for healing. So if, you, if you've been sexually active and your partner breaks up with you and your relationship ends, you've got this sphere of pain and you just bounce right into another relationship. You actually have not, the pain that you're still suffering from the first one is diminishing oxytocin release, so it impairs your ability to bond to the next person you're with. So even if you're sexually active with the next person, you don't have the cl- as close a bond as you would have had if you would have waited and allowed your brain to rewire and heal from the first relationship. So this, this results in increased risk of sexual addiction. So benefits of abstinence until marriage. Well, we think more clearly. We make better assessments before we chemically bond and neurologically rewire our brain to someone. Better sex and more intense bonding when you do marry. It's better. Avoid higher levels of emotional pain if the relationship does fail. And avoid the risk of STD, sexually transmitted diseases in pregnancy. Avoid damage to our conscience and the guilt and the fear cascade that we talked about. Decrease risk of sexual addiction. If previously sexually active, if you've been previously sexually active and you're not married, allow time for the neural circuits to reset, i.e. singleness and sexual abstinence before going out and dating and getting involved again. Allow your time to heal. Now these are back now. So that's kind of the overview of, of all the neurobiologic stuff. And now we're going to go into the questions with this as our background and our foundation to be able to pull from to answer the questions. Uh, some of them are just data questions. This is one of them. What percentage of teens have sex? According to the sexual activity, uh, the, according to this particular survey, which is a youth risk behavior surveillance, 32% of ninth graders, 43% of 10th graders, 55% of 11th graders, and 64% of 12th graders across the United States have had sex. The 2003 Youth, behavioral, youth Risk Behavioral uh, Surveillance. Statistics on teen sexual activity and ethnicity in high school. 34% of teen girls in the United States become pregnant at least once before the age of 20. One in three. Now, get this. Teen pregnancy in the, UA, in the U.S. is ten times that of Japan, four times that of France and Germany, and twice that of Great Britain. And you know what the punchline is, Right? yet the U.S. has the highest percentage of Christians than any of these other countries. What does that tell you? Just say no doesn't work. We have to change their beliefs. And we're not giving them the beliefs. And I'm going to tell you you something else. I think we're giving our kids a God that they're afraid of. And that impairs healthy bonding to God and the help that they would need to overcome some of these temptations. Uh, the majority of the teens, those teens who had sex, the majority, 60% overall and 67% among the younger adolescents, regret their first experience and wish they'd waited. So if, if any teens are in here, take a lesson from teens who've been there. Most of them think this was bad, they didn't want to do it, they regretted it, and wish they wouldn't have done it. Another question. Why are people having sex younger and younger these days? Why do teens feel they have to have sex when they're in high school? The media influence alters beliefs. We form a lot of false beliefs based on watching television programming and media, such as everyone's doing it, so I must be weird not to. We have to replace a false belief like that with a truth. And the truth would be, I don't care who else is doing it, I'm wise not to. That's the truth. Um, False belief, there's no harm. Truth, there is harm. You've seen the data, there's a lot of harm. False belief. It's what you do when you love someone. What's the truth? What's the truth? It's what you don't do if you love someone outside of marriage. Because if you love someone, well, we'll get to that later. If you love someone, you want to protect them. You don't want to exploit them. Media influences alter brain development. I didn't mention this in the earlier, but when a, when a child comes into the world, the child has at birth, an infant, hundreds of millions of neurons, more at birth than that brain, that child's brain has by the time they're eight years of age. First eight years of life, the brain is busy killing off brain cells by the hundreds of millions. Now, at first, that doesn't sound too good, but conceptualize it like this. Michelangelo's block of marble, when Michelangelo gets it, and Michelangelo's block of marble when he's done with it. When Michelangelo is done, doesn't he have less marble? 
But he has a masterpiece. Our brain comes into the world prepared to be acted upon by education, environment, experience, neural circuits which are exercised or expanded and, and retained, neural circuits which are not being used, the brain will delete. Thus, you've probably all heard of tragic situations of children which were locked in cages. No one ever spoke any language to them. They are discovered and rescued at age 12, 13, 14. They can never learn to speak language correctly. Maybe 50 or 100 word vocabulary is all they can develop. Because the neural circuits that correspond to language were not used, the brain either reassigned them or deleted them. Well, this happens through the brain. Understanding that process of normal brain development, exercising neural circuits, keep them, not exercising them, don't develop them or delete them, theatrical television watching. Theatrical television watching has the primary purpose of activating the limbic system while simultaneously turning off the prefrontal cortex. So the more TV kids watch during the developmental years, the more development of the limbic system, the less development of the prefrontal cortex. And so when they hit adolescence and the hormones hit, they have all this irritability, this moodiness, this, this, these impulses that they cannot process and control with their prefrontal cortex. And so they act out aggressively, irritably, often sexually, and will often turn to alcohol and drugs to calm a limbic system their prefrontal cortex can't calm. So television watching not only changes belief systems, it actually changes the normal development of a brain so they're more prone to be impulsive and less able to restrain themselves in adolescence. Divorce. The studies are very clear. Families in which there is divorce, the kids are more prone to have sex at an early age. So if families can work out their differences and, and avoid divorce, but that doesn't mean that... that if you're in a situation where you know, somebody's molesting one of the kids in the home, one of the parents is molesting one of the kids, well, the, the, the one who's not needs to separate that situation. So it doesn't mean divorce should never happen. But if you can work it out and keep the kids safe, then it, it's, it's going to help protect them. Low parental monitoring or low parental rules or coercive homes. So let's go through each of those. So if you have a home in which the parents don't really monitor or have any real rules, that will increase early onset of sexual activity. Or homes in which there is excessive coercive control, then that also causes rebellion and early sexual activity. Permissive parental attitudes. That would be parents may have rules, but they also say, hey, it's okay. Uh, you know, we did it when we were early. You guys go ahead and have fun. Per permissive parental attitudes would connote an idea that it's okay. And then genetics. Believe it or not, studies show that the, er, the age in which you were first sexually active as a parent predicts very closely the age your kids will be first sexually active. And this has to do with the genes that control impulsivity. Impulsivity. And so we have the inability to restrain our impulses, and when we get those sexual impulses, we have a difficult time restraining them. And so par parents who have impulse control problems will often have kids with impulse control problems. We can make those worse by having a lot of television watching during the developmental years, and we don't develop the prefrontal cortex, which self-governs and restrains. We can have our kids that are even more impulsive than we might have been. Question, why does God allow something as special as sex to be, sinful, uh, to be a sinful temptation outside of marriage? If God wanted one man to marry one woman, and that would be the perfect union, then why did Solomon, David, and many other holy people have many, many wives or concubines? How would you answer the question? Are these questions about sex? No, these questions are not about sex. These questions are about freedom, autonomy, liberty, and the universe in which love exists. God is love, and love requires freedom. Genuine love cannot exist in an atmosphere without freedom. Those in a relationship, try that. Go home and begin telling your spouse where they can go, uh, what they can do, who, who they can call on the phone, what clothes they're allowed to wear, how much money they're allowed to spend, and see what happens to love in that relationship. Love can't exist without freedom. God is love. We have real freedom. And so, uh, when God gives gifts to his people, to his creatures, he leaves us free to use them. Did God give Samson strength? Did God control how Samson used it? No. Did God give Solomon wisdom? Yes, but he didn't control how he used it. And did God give humanity sexuality? Yes, but he doesn't control how he uses it. So these questions are about understanding God's universe. Whatever gifts he gives us, he leaves us free. So this is about freedom because love is real in God's universe. Sex is so distorted, how did he get that way? Well, we lost the knowledge of God his design, his methods, resulting in either, what did it result in? Either hedonism or puritanism. Hedonism, 
Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. We're no better than the animals. Go out and have as much fun as you can before you die on this earth. Hedonism. Puritanism. Sex is dirty and evil. You should never have it except to procreate and never again. These are both lies. Because we lost the knowledge of God and we lost his design. What is the truth? Sex is sacred and beautiful. That is the truth. Have we not seen some beauty tonight in God's design? The union, the bonding that takes place? By the way, many of you that that aren't physicians may not know, but do you know the bone right here in this part of your body? It's the sacrum. It means sacred. Just think about that. Why shouldn't we have sex? How would you answer this question? You should have sex, and lots of it, but only with your marriage partner. Only with your spouse. Premarital sex damages mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That's why you shouldn't have premarital sex. Sexual active adolescents perform more poorly in school, engage in a host of risk-taking behaviors, including substance use and delinquency, and are half as likely to have stable marriages compared to teens who are not sexually active. So if you're a teen and you want a stable marriage, you can double the likelihood of a stable marriage by maintaining your abstinence. Double your likelihood. Will there be sex in heaven? This has not been revealed, so each person is free to hope yes or no. And I won't ask which way you're hoping. (laughs) If sex is a mean of pleasure as well as reproduction, why promote abstinence when sex often changes the marriage? Premarital sex would help affirm a commitment causing a more stable relationship, would it not? Kind of like test driving a car. How would you answer? Sex is not a means of pleasure. It's a means of unity, bonding, self-giving, self-surrender, self-exposure, and reproduction, which God designed to be pleasurable. You see the problem in the question. This is what it's a means of, and God designed it, and God designed it as pleasurable. Premarital sex causes all the biological changes already outlined, plus it increases anxiety, guilt, deception, which damages prefrontal cortex, causes more activation of the fear circuits, with subsequent increase in risk of depression, physical health problems, and damage to character. So it's probably not a good idea. Is safe sex okay at a young age? Using condoms does not prevent all the brain changes which occur during sex. Using condoms does not prevent guilt, fear, anxiety, deception to parents and peers. Condoms are not 100% effective. So the answer would be no. It's not safe. Is it a sin to have sex before marriage? Is it biblically wrong to have sex before marriage? Is sex before marriage bad even if you marry the person you had sex with? Two people ask that question. What is sin? The Bible says sin is transgression of the law. What law? The, what law? Law of love, which is the design template for life. We went through briefly the other centered circle of giving that life is designed to operate upon. So why is something then sin? Because it deviates with the protocols for which life and health operate upon and can only result in ruin, pain, suffering, and death. So, and that's what that says. So then the question, is something sin because God says not to do it? Or does God say not to do it because it's sin? Did that confuse you? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's God says not to do it because it is harmful. Why does a parent say, don't play in the street? Is it, is it bad to play in the street because the parents say don't do it? Or is it bad to play in the street because you could get hit by a car? It's dangerous out there. And that's why the parents said not to do it. What does sex before marriage do to you? This is the question for these. What does sex before marriage do to you? It changes you neurologically, neurobiologically. It alters your ability to have good judgment. And so, the question, the last question about is it, uh, sex before marriage bad even if you marry the person you had sex with? Marriage doesn't change your history. It doesn't change all the stuff you did before marriage. So if you've already gone through a lot of guilt, practicing deception, lying to people, you have damaged yourself. That doesn't undo it. And you may not have married them if you didn't have sex with them. 
Because once you have sex, you're more neurologically bonded. That person can cause you to feel better than any other person. You're more attached. You have that airbrushing of your memory. Your discernment goes down. You might not have married this person if you hadn't had sex with them. What are the benefits of sex before marriage? None. None. But many harmful consequences. I couldn't think of a benefit of sex before marriage. What's your idea of the safest lines teen should draw in showing physical affection? Any volunteered answers? No, no, I see a lot of hits. No. <laughs> Problem with the question. Bad question. See, this question is about how much can I get away with? How far can I go seeking to gratify self? We need to have better questions. And so we ask the question to the teens, how can I protect my partner's sexuality and help them become all God wants them to be? Better question. Or, how about this one? How can I value, celebrate, and protect the other person who might some, be someone else's Adam and Eve one day? And if you're not sure about that, those questions aren't resonating in your mind, teens. Think about this question. Where would you draw the line for your sister, mother, or brother? Your dad died, your mom's a widow, she's out dating. Where do you want her to draw that line? Ew. Yeah, that's where that line goes, doesn't it? (laughs) Treat your partner with love, seeking to protect their integrity, honor, virtue, reputation, and health. That's where you draw the line. Any line which damages you or the other person should not be crossed. That's where you draw the line. Sex, is it as worth it before marriage as it's made out to be? I don't know who asked this question, but I'll let you answer it. After all the science... In evidence, what do you think? Is it worth it? If you plan on marrying someone after being with them for a very long time, is it sinful to have sex? And is God angry with us even though you love that person beyond description? And if you pray together and love God, then how is it wrong? I have a patient who prays every day for healthy lungs but smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. How could it be wrong to to smoke if she prays? You see a problem with the question. You see, I'm not angry at my patient for smoking, but is my anger the problem? Well, will my doctor be angry at me if, he smoke, if I smoke? Will God be angry at me if I do? God's not going to be angry. But prayer doesn't void your choice or change God's laws. It doesn't change the laws of physics, the laws of neurobiology that we all went through. You may pray, but that's not going to change what's happening. The only thing that changes what's happening is your will, free will choices. Choices change what happens to you. If you love the person, you would seek their best interest to protect their sexual, sexuality, integrity, and virtue. That, you see, this question, if we really love each other, if you really love them, you want to do what's best for them, not what makes you feel good. We don't know the future or our plans, and our plans don't always work out. So your plan to marry isn't the same thing as being married. Is it? No. Does sex hurt? Four people ask this question. Not as God designed. But it can if there's illness, physical defects, high anxiety, or it's done aggressively, violently, or carelessly. What is adultery? Any volunteers to answer this? Betrayal. Adultery is betrayal. That's what it is. The giving of one's heart, mind, soul, oneself to another. The failure to sacrifice self for one's spouse. This is what adultery is. If you're confused about that, just think of what God called the people in the Old Testament repeatedly. What did he call them? An adulterous nation. An adulterous people. Think about Matthew 5. You say if you commit adultery, and I say if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, it's a heart issue primarily. But it can include physical sex, but it doesn't have to. Are you still a virgin if you've had an orgasm? Are you considered a virgin if uh, if you've had sex other than vaginal sex? Why do people think oral sex takes your virginity? Okay, I'm about to show you a picture of the most important sexual organ in your body. You never really generally see this in public. This is the most important sexual organ of your body. It's your brain. 
All the neurobiologic stuff happens there. All the relational bonding stuff happens there. All the pleasure happens there. The brain is the most important sexual organ. Man's perspective on questions like virginity focuses on the body. God's perspective focuses on the heart. What's happening in your heart, in your brain. Lust, remember the Matthew 5 text. God is concerned about the heart, the character. So we have to take the focus off the body and back onto the heart to answer these questions. So what happens in the heart if somebody has a nocturnal emission? If somebody is sexually abused or raped? See, man, and and legalistic man, would say if somebody is abused or raped, they've lost their virginity, God would say they're still pure of heart. They haven't given themselves. They have not violated themselves. Isn't that true? Absolutely true. It's not about the body primarily. It's about the heart primarily and what we choose to do with what the gifts God has given us. This is a book called Soul Versions by Doug Rosenau and Michael Todd Wilson. And they talk about being a soul virgin and taking the focus off the body onto the heart, mind, or soul. And they use this definition, soul virgin. One who continuously seeks to value, celebrate, and protect God's design for sexuality, body, soul, and spirit in oneself and others. And I think that's a great definition. And I think that's what we should teach our kids. That's what virginity is all about, a pure heart. Remember, David said, create me a clean heart, O God, and renew your right spirit within me. That's where it's at. Where uh, where does sex start? What line needs to be crossed for it to be classified as sex? Does sex start when the pants are unbuttoned or before that or after that? How far is too far for high school students? Is making out just as bad as having sex before marriage? Sex starts in the mind. That's where it starts. Doesn't it always start in the mind? Absolutely. Sex starts in the mind. Any thoughts which would harm any thoughts which would harm you or another is already going too far. What does it say in Second Corinthians? We're to bring every thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. And see, we again focus on behavior primarily, but the behavior isn't the, is, isn't primarily the issue God is looking at. You may never cross a behavioral line, but your mind, think what you can do in your mind. Um, and in fact, what we I don't have time to go in the whole neurotrophic factor stuff and how neurons grow stronger, neural pathways grow stronger, but we can control behavior. We can put people in prison, we can lock pedophiles away. Can we control what's going on in their mind? And if they're doing it in their mind, and I, I could walk through the neurobiology of it and the, and the various neurotrophic factors involved, but if you activate the circuits in your mind, you spend energy on it, you fire the circuits, the brain produces more of these factors and make those circuits grow stronger. So even though they can't practice this thing, if they're doing it in their mind, the deviant circuits grow stronger. You may lock them up for 10 years, but if they're still doing it in their mind for 10 years, they may come out more twisted than they went in. So we, we don't focus on behavior only. We want to focus on what's happening in the heart and mind. We want our minds to change, our hearts to change. So where does, where does making out lead your mind and, beha- and then your behavior? If God will forgive you, then why can't you have sex before marriage? What kind of God construct is going on with this question? A legal model. Yeah, it's all about you know, getting God to forgive us. That's our problem. Is the sin problem God's attitude or our condition? What's the sin problem? Our, our condition or God's attitude? Our condition. If your parents will forgive you for not brushing your teeth, why brush them? If a smoker asks forgiveness but keeps on smoking, what happens? You see, the forgiveness from God is not the primary thing. God extends forgiveness. He is forgiving. The question is, what are you choosing to do and what does that do to you? Are you following his plan to be in harmony with his methods, to cooperate with his spirit, to experience regeneration and healing? Or are you choosing things that destroy you all the while claiming forgiveness from God? It's a deception. It's a lie. God's forgiveness doesn't prevent the damage of ongoing sin. Does it? No. Can you make sex with your spouse dirty, or is whatever you do with your spouse considered fine? Is anal sex bad if done with spouses? Oral sex or role play okay in marriage? Sex as God designed is the culmination of other-centered love and unity of two beings into a sacred bond. Anything which counters this is harmful. Anything which enhances it is blessed. Therefore, genuine equality, mutual consent, freedom, yes. 
Domination, control, humiliation, submission, bondage, abuse, etc. No. What other purpose for sex than multiplying the human race? Well, there's a lot of them. Bonding, genuine other-centered love, unity, oneness, entering into godliness, revealing God's character. All those things are part of what God designed for sex. Why is it okay for divorce to divorce and marry another person, but not have sex with more than one person? Any, anybody want to throw something out? Divorce only occurs when love breaks down, when selfishness wins. It's not God's design. It's not part of his plan. He hates divorce, which is not part of his ideal. But in a sick world, it is an emergency measure of grace to save and heal those in inseparably destructive irreparably destructive marriages. Kind of like doing an appendectomy to save somebody from dying from appendicitis. That's what divorce is about. And, and believe you me, if you do what I do for a living, you can see there are some terribly destructive relationships out there where people are being beaten, dominated, and abused, and it is harmful. And, and the only solution to save is to, is to get out of that toxic and destructive situation. It's not God's design, but it is emergency measure of grace. The the other, however, the premarital sex issue, sex before marriage, actually inflicts injury and is not behavior which heals or ends something harmful. It would be like cutting oneself with a knife when uh, when healthy, inflicting a wound. That's what premarital sex is. So they're two totally different contexts, two totally different things. Um, Due to the fact God made man and, and woman and told them to multiply, is celibacy a sin the opposite of love? Outside of marriage, No. Inside of marriage, it depends. And this is Paul's uh, guidance about the husband's body is not his own, the wife's body is not his own, they shouldn't deny each other their body except for mutual consent for a brief time to pray and meditate and so forth. Um, So, if withholding sex is done to manipulate, control, punish, or for other selfish motives within a marriage, then it is not love. It's wrong. What diseases can you get from sex? There you go. 19 million STD infections occur annually, almost half of them in people age 15 to 24 years of age. So that's like almost 8 million, I mean, almost, yes, 9.5 million a year young people getting infected with all these diseases. Can you get AIDS from anal and oral sex? Yes, and from any sex, not just those, any sex, any exchange of body fluids. Can you get AIDS if you have uh, only sex with virgins? Think that question through. (laughs) Yes, you can. And how do you know they're a virgin? Well, they said so. Hmm. But yes, you can. Because virgins, people who truly have never had sex, can still have AIDS. You can get AIDS from IV drug use. You can get AIDS from blood, blood products. You can get AIDS from um, a nurse at a hospital who gets stuck with a, a needle of somebody that they're working with. Surgeon, I know, uh, I know of surgeons who've gotten cut in the OR. I mean, you can get AIDS from lots of different ways, not just sexually. Why use a condom, birth control, and decrease the likelihood of a sexually transmitted disease? I don't understand herpes. Can you have sex with someone with herpes and not get it? Can you get it with the lesions are inflamed or when they are not inflamed? And the answer is yes. Can you get an STD from oral sex? Yes. Uh, how do you make a baby? It's like six people asked this question. The joining of a sperm and an egg implantation in a womb. Pretty straightforward. Sperm, egg, womb, baby. <laughs> Does holding hands make you pregnant? Three people asked this question. They're probably not here tonight. No, it does not. Can you get pregnant without having sex? Yes. In vitro fertilization, artificial insemination, yes, you can get pregnant without having sex. Now, I'll tell you a really interesting fascinoma case here in a little bit about men getting pregnant. Uh, Can you get pregnant on your period? Yes. How can you get pregnant and what is the easiest way to prevent it? You get pregnant by having sex, easiest way to prevent it, don't have sex. (laughs) If you are pregnant and have sex, what does the baby feel? Nothing different than any of the time mom's body's moving around. Is it true that sex in a hot tub is safe because sperm die in the heat? (laughs) 
Remember, these are questions from the kids. The answer, of course, is only if you're having sex with the hot tub. (laughs) Is there a safe time of a month of a girl's cycle to have sex? No. Uh, Why do girls get so attached after sex and guys couldn't care at all? Actually, guys get attached too, but women are biologically more relationally um, adaptive. They're anterior cingulate cortexes, where we experience other center of love, compassion, empathy, is larger than men's biologically. This is why women are more, more compassionate by nature than men. And women are more oxytocin sensitive than men. So men do get attached, but women are, are more likely to be attached a little more quickly than men. How do you uh, tell love sex from lust sex? That's a pretty good question, don't you think? Yeah. Love seeks to uplift and protect the other, so would only pursue sex within marriage, uh, within marriage with a volunta- voluntary spouse. Because love, you know, lust can happen in a marriage too, and we can abuse our spouses. Um, lust sex seeks to gratify self and doesn't seek to promote the well-being of the other, and this, of course, can happen. This type of, of mistreatment can happen within a marriage. Uh, how do you overcome the fear of someone cheating on you and stabbing you in the back? Evidence over time. It's the only way to overcome fear of of somebody not being trustworthy is you have to see them over time and how they live and behave to see whether they can be trusted. Does a bigger penis mean more pleasure? No correlation between size and pleasure. Is masturbation a sin? Uh, Five, six people ask this. There's a a, a fully comprehensive blog I put on my website dealing with this issue with biblical references and everything. And so you can just go to comeandreason.com in the blog archives and you'll see the question on masturbation. Why do I feel so bad about the fact I had sex even though I made it right with the Lord? Now, what do you think about this question? Even though I made it right with the Lord. You bring a lamb at sacrifice... Made it right with the Lord. What does that mean? How do you make it right with the Lord? First question, what does that mean? How do you make it right with the Lord? What does it mean to make it right with the Lord? What does the Lord want to make right? See, the Lord wants to heal your mind. Is your mind now operating in harmony with his design? See, this is the question. I had a patient who had married, had a one-night, single, one-time affair, felt completely guilt-ridden immediately after the affair. She went home, confessed it to her husband, confessed it to God, asked forgiveness. Husband forgave her, God forgave her. She went down to the altar at church, confessed it, got rebaptized. yet seven years have gone by, and she continues to have recurrent guilt. She's been down to the altar probably 20 times at church, um, had special anointings and prayer, and she's still consumed with guilt over this affair. What's going on? Well, when somebody has an affair, if you remember how the mind we looked at, prefrontal cortex, thinking, reasoning, conscience, good judgment, limbic system, all those powerful emotions, does somebody have an affair because their good judgment goes, you know what, this is going to be really healthy for me, my husband's going to be proud of me, and, and the good judgment makes this decision? Or is it because powerful emotions overrule their judgment? What happens? How does an affair go into yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the brain being turned upside down, basically. It's our powerful emotions overruling good judgment, and, and this is why people get into affairs. She never had another affair after seven years, but she actually never changed the way her mind worked either. And so she was having the same, same phenomenon happening. For instance, at work, somebody says, hey, can I borrow your car? And her judgment says, no, I have limited insurance. You've been in three wrecks in the last three months. No. But her emotions go, well, I don't want her to be mad at me. I want her to, to like me. I, I don't want to have, have, have a conflict at work. And so based on fear and insecurity, she lets the person borrow the car. Now, is that substantially any different than the affair? No. It's feelings, overruling judgment, same dynamic, same process. But where in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not let a coworker borrow thy car? There's no, there's no rule for it. She gets this terrible guilt feeling, but there's nothing direct to attach it to. Her mind regurgitated the most egregious episode or evidence of this type of process, which is that affair. So every time for the last seven years that she allowed her feelings to overrule her judgment, she got guilt for the affair. And so once she began using her uh, uh, power of choice to follow her judgment, all the guilt for the affair finally went away. So this goes back to the question. Uh, I feel bad about the fact I had sex even though I made it right with the Lord. Has your mind been healed? This is all God wants. You don't have to do something to make it right with Him. He wants to do something to make you right. 
To balance your mind, heal your heart. So, I just told that story. Um, we can't change history. Whatever history, historical events, can't change them. Imagine that you have somebody just gashed your leg with a knife. You're wounded. Can you go back and undo it once the wound's there? Can you redo? Once we've made a mistake, can we go back and undo history and redo it? No. So we only have three options once we've, once we've made a mistake, once we have a wound. Option number one, heal it as quickly as we can. Antibiotic, sutures, and, uh, antiseptic. Option number two, ignore it. Nothing wrong with me, I'll be fine. Option number three, actively infect it. Rub some manure in it. That's, that's our three options once we have a wound. Same thing happens with this kind of stuff. Heal it as quickly as we can. Get our mind in balance. Do God's design. Ignore it. Infect it. Make it worse. So, this is, this is what God wants to do, is heal our hearts, heal our minds. We can experience. After David murdered Uriah and, uh, and stole Bathsheba, he couldn't undo that. But he did experience a new heart and a right spirit. He was changed in the inner man. This is what God wants to do to each of us, and that's what needs to happen. Okay, why is our school so oblivious to how many kids, younger class especially, are having sex? They do not care. This was the answer I had prepared. I don't know, does it still apply? Um, anyway, is homosexuality sin, oral or anal sex between men? Anybody recognize this person? Yeah, this is maybe helps. Caster Semenya. She is the woman who is South African athlete who won gold medal at the World Track competition, and her medals have been taken from her because they found she had a condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome. Androgen insensitivity syndrome, very fascinating syndrome formerly called testicular fe- feminization. You see, males, chromosomally, X chromosome and Y chromosome. Females, chromosomally, two X chromosomes. Now, the Y chromosome codes for the testes, and the, uh, and the testicles produce both testosterone and a hormone called anti-mullerian hormone. Interestingly enough, though, the receptor that recognizes testosterone is coded on the X chromosome. Now, this particular condition is a condition in which the mom donates the X chromosome, dad donates the Y chromosome, uh, the embryo is forming, they form testes, testes are producing anti-malarian hormone and testosterone, but there are no receptors to recognize testosterone. Now, why is that important? Anti-malarian hormone... um, Anti-malarian hormone prevents the uterus from de- and the upper two-thirds of the vagina from ever developing. So this individual has anti-malarian horm- hormone, no vagina, no uterus, no fallopian tubes. But without testosterone receptors, there's no receptors in the body, so the labia do not transform into the scrotum and the clitoris does not transform into the penis based on the influences of testosterone that is circulating, but there's no receptors. And so this XY chromosomal male is born a healthy baby female. All governments of the world recognize the rights of these ASI women, XY, to marry men. Now, who sinned? Who sinned that this man was born blind, they asked Jesus. Jesus answered, neither this man, was, this, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happens so that the work of God might be displayed in him. Who sinned that this person was born with a sexual defect? All creation groans over the way to sin, the Bible tells us. The whole human race, the whole world has is, is got uh, biological defects because of sin. This is what's called intersex. These are all the biological conditions that alter someone's sexual identity. I want to tell you about Swire syndrome. Swire syndrome, these kids, these are uh, an XY, XY chromosomal um, embryo is developing, but they have true gonadal uh, dysgenesis. In other words, they don't have gonads at all. The testes never form in any form or fashion. And so what that means is there's no testosterone and there's no anti-malarian hormone, which means that these XY little babies form with full vaginas, uteruses, and fallopian tubes. Born healthy little baby girls, but no ovaries. So they're sterile. Um, But they have all the reproductive organs of a woman except the ovaries. There have been at least four documented cases now where through embryo, embryo donation, implantation, there have been four, at least four healthy babies born to these XY men that are actually get female birth certificates. And they're actually women, but women with an X and a Y. All of these different conditions are some type of, some type of um, sexual intersex between male and female. 
Mosaicism, mosaicism is when you have two different cell lines in the same human being. So in the same person, you will have some of the cells of the body with XX, some of the cells of the body with XY, or XXY, XX, or XXXY, XX, you will have in the same person, different cell lines in the same person. Um, one, of this, one of these types of mosaicism is called a chimer. And a chimer is when, uh, say, fraternal twins, you have two ovums and you have two sperms fertilized. So you have fraternal, fraternal twins forming, and those fraternal twins will fuse and become one person. And so that person then is born as an individual, but they're actually two different cell lines. Now, a case happened in a case happened in um, Colorado of a woman who was living with a man, had three children, and uh, they weren't married. They separated, and she filed in, in court for child support. The court ordered paternity testing, and with paternity testing of the dad, and they also test mom, the, the paternity test came back 99.99% mom's kid, uh, dad, excuse me, dad's kids, 99.99% not the woman who was filing for this stuff. So the court, the district attorney arrests her, going to file her for, uh, um, going to fine her for all types of fraud, that she's in court crying, please. And these are my kids, got all these pictures of them growing up and everything, so that she happened to be pregnant with her fourth child. So the judge postponed a finding and, and ordered a representative of the court to be in the labor room as this next child came out of her body, and this next child came out of her body, took samples from the woman, samples from the kid, and it came back 99.99% not hers. Now the DA is going to prosecute her for embryo stealing, accusing her of going to some embryo place and stealing embryos and doing implantation to, to do some type of fraud. And some uh, professor at Harvard University heard about it, flew out, tested her. She is a chimer. She and her fraternal sister. So she is, is her blood, but her reproductive organs were her sisters, who they fuse into one. So this type of strange and bizarre things. Now, I, I say all this because... Oh, and according to the North, um, uh, the Intersex Society of North America, um, those having one of the conditions listed on the previous page, 1% of live births exhibit some degree of sexual ambiguity, and 0.1 and 2% of live births have so much ambiguity that they require medical intervention or surgical intervention. So that would be one to two people out of every thousand people. So what determines male and female? What determines male and female? Yeah, I think about this question, and we think about sin. There's a difference between sin and, and, and what sin has done. For instance, there are people born sterile. That is a consequence of sin. It's not part of God's design. It's a deviation from God's design. God designed them to be fertile, to be fruitful and multiply. But is being born sterile a sin? No, it's a consequence of sin. And we have to distinguish what sin has done from what sin actually is. And so what determines male and female? Do the chromosomes determine male and female? I mean, you guys tell me, does genitalia determine male and female? Does mental orientation, identity, individuality? Does behavior? You guys tell me, what determines male and female? What does it mean? It means that all these defects are a result of sin damaging this creation, but does that mean they're all acts of sin? Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. It's not our place to judge others. We don't know their circumstances. It's our job as Christians to love a homosexual like Christ loved the prostitute. And bring that person to Christ, and in a relationship with Christ, as he renews their heart, any change in behavior will happen as the heart gets renewed to be like Christ. Any inappropriate behaviors that need to change, Christ will change those behaviors. It's not our job to convict a sinner, change other people. Is that right? So, what can parents do to help protect their kids? I know it's a slide y'all been waiting for. Last slide. Um, work out any marital difficulties to avoid divorce if possible. That actually is protected for your kids. Communicate parental disapproval of premarital sex. And this is not having a sex talk to communicate the birds and the bees. It's actually communicating directly to them that you disapprove of premarital sex. It has been shown that ex expressly communicated parental disapproval is protective and delays the onset of sex for teens. Avoid the ambiguous messages and the mixed signals, which would be tell them no, but then make jokes about it and laugh about it like it's funny and it's okay. You have to avoid that kind of messaging as well. Uh, engage teens in a meaningful, warm relationship where you actually spend time with your teens, bonding with your teens. If you have a warm, bonded relationship with your teens, this has actually been shown to be protective. They will delay the onset of sexual activity when they have a close relationship with their parents. Mothers are especially important in this process, it's the, the data shows. Uh, uh, actively monitor your teens. Greater parental monitoring and rules correlate with reduced teen sexual activity. 
though not coercively rigid rules. In other words, these abusive, coercive homes will result in rebellion. But a loving home with, with enforced healthy boundaries and rules and monitoring results in kids being more responsible. And then limit theatrical entertainment during especially the developmental years. But that overactive limbic system, uh, number one, altering the beliefs that people form about this stuff. So you can protect your kids' belief formation and their brain development by limiting theatrical entertainment. And then finally, educate your kids on God's design for humanity and the reasons for waiting. Reasons for waiting until marriage. Questions? Talk just a bit about how the same targets the image of man one of Satan's goal is to put his image where God should be and so he wants us to become self-centered exploitive of other individuals rather than loving and self-sacrificing individuals and sexuality is one of these places where he can uh, tempt us and get us to take activities which inflame limbic system incite fear damage prefrontal cortex and cause us to be more exploitive of others. We can be sexually addicted. And sexual addiction doesn't have to be pornographic addiction. People have sexual addiction with people. And they go from person to person to person to person to person. And they have sexual addiction. And so this type of of destructive stuff, it impairs healthy love. It it incites fear, anxiety, and and it it actually causes these neurobiologic changes that impair the anterior cingulate cortex from other-centered love. Yeah. seems like there's a study in Idaho Showed that in at least a certain district where we're there, the education has no benefit whatsoever for sexual activity with the public. Yeah, the normal, normal sexual education protocols um, were, were, didn't have any benefit, but the benefit was not as powerful as the parental interventions. The parental interventions were more powerful than a, somebody coming into a classroom and giving a traditional sex education lec- lecture. They haven't actually done any studies on what I just presented. And again, p- tying it together with God's design and giving them that information. That's never been done. Because they don't do that. They do it from a very humanistic perspective. And they do it basically biologic birds and bees, and they do it primarily with, with STDs as the uh, reason to avoid. And then how to have safe sex, which is all about avoiding STDs. They don't teach all this stuff in those sex education classes that, that we went through tonight, that I know of anyway. Other questions? Thank you all very much for coming tonight.